distinguished visitors in the audience, Admiral Aquilino and Mrs. Aquilino, Admiral Paparo and Mrs. Paparo, Congressman Case, Congressman Woman Takuda, Senator De La Cruz, Senator Aquino, the Consul General from the Philippines, Emilio Fernandez, along with all the Consul Generals from countries in the Indo-Pacific as well as around the world that are here today. I also want to give a shout out to Lieutenant General Retired Fig Leaf, who was the former director here at APCSS. Also to Major General Retired Susie Veris Lum, the president of the East West Center. Ambassadors, flag officers, general officers, and other distinguished guests. And to the ladies and gentlemen that are here at the center, a warm aloha to all of you. Thank you for coming as well as those that are up on Zoom and in YouTube from across the Indo-Pacific region, including many of our distinguished alumni and local Hawaii community leaders. So for everyone, the speaker series started in 2018 as a collaborative effort by three institutions to honor the legacy of the late Senator Daniel K. Inouye by sharing with the local community and others around the region his vision to foster a security environment that's characterized by mutual understanding, cooperation, and peace. In short, promoting a free and prosperous environment for future generations to enjoy. I would now like to take this opportunity to invite my two co-hosts Ms. Jennifer Sabas and Mr. Jerry Samita to provide a few opening remarks. Aloha and good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Daniel K. Inouye Institute, thank you all so much for coming. It is an honor to serve as a co-host for the lecture series. country. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Mr. President, distinguished members of this gathering, my name is Jerry Sumida and I'm the president of the Foundation for the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. The foundation was established almost during the early days of this center in order to provide two things. One is support, financial and otherwise, for the center and its programs. And secondly, to help broaden the reach of the center into the broader communities in Hawaii. Hawaii, as you know, is in the center of this particular region, the Pacific region, and has always striven to play a major role in this particular part of the globe, with its importance increasing on a daily basis. And as you know, Hawaii and the Philippines have a very, very strong historical tradition, historical and cultural tradition. So we are very pleased to join with the center and with our colleagues at Daniel K. Inouye Institute to sponsor this program and also welcome you and hope you have a very pleasant journey here and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Jerry. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, it is now my great honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency, Ferdinand R. Marcos, Jr. Thank you uh, very much uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, the uh, director uh, of the DKI APCSS, uh, Director Pete Kumatautau, uh, the uh, DKI Institute Director, Jennifer Sabas, the APCSS Foundation President, Gerald Sumida, 
Her Excellency Mary Kay Carlson, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines, the U.S. Indo-PACCOM Commander, Admiral John Aquilino, members of the Philippine delegation, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And I think the uh, traditional greeting is aloha. Aloha. I am uh, very pleased to be able to uh, speak with you today uh, here, especially since it is a particular pleasure uh, that I am here at the Daniel Inouye Center. As has been mentioned, uh, Senator Inouye was a great friend of my father and equally importantly, a great friend of the Philippines. As a matter of fact, one of his last acts in uh, uh, Congress uh, that involved the Philippines was that he was able to finally um, arrange for the back pay of the so-called Bolo men that fought together with the Americans during the Second World War. And I wrote him a letter and he responded to me and we were both very, very pleased and just a little bit sorry that my father was not here, uh, was not around to, uh, notice, to, to note what, will, what had been achieved and uh, what he had been working for since the, since the end of the last war. So this uh, event caps the six-day, three-city working visit to the United States, which I have just undertaken. It is my third visit since I assumed the presidency in 2022. This Honolulu leg is, of course, a bit of a special one for many reasons. First of all, Hawaii is home to a significant number of Filipinos and Filipino-Americans, many of whom, the, the original uh, immigrant workers, uh, came from my home province or my home region of Ilocos Norte, which is the northern part of the Philippines. The Ilocos-Hawaii connection began here with our so-called sacadas, or workers, arriving in 1906 as plantation workers. And then, as uh, events be, be, uh, conspired, Filipinos were also fighting shoulder to shoulder with American soldiers during the war. Today, Honolulu hosts the headquarters of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, the long-standing partnership between the armed forces of the Philippines and the Indo-PACCOM have resulted in enhanced coordination, interoperability, and individual and joint defense capabilities. This is to ensure that we both uphold our commitment to our treaty alliance, especially in the face of growing and evolving regional and global challenges to our security. It's no coincidence that I spent this morning before coming here with Admiral John Aquilino. We had a very uh, productive and useful exchange on regional developments and the critical role of the Philippine-U.S. alliance to promote peace and to safeguard the international law-based order, to ensure resilient, sustainable, and inclusive growth for our economies and our communities. It is the third visit that I have made to the United States since becoming president. And in this, for this visit, I have had the privilege to speak about my vision for the Philippines and the world through the platforms provided by the ASA Society in New York, the CSIS in Washington, and now here in the APCSS, here in the Aloha State. My message has always been firm, simple, and clear. The Philippines will continue to be an engaged and responsible neighbor and partner, always finding ways to collaborate with the end goal of mutually beneficial outcomes, namely peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. It is through working together, guided by the rules-based international order, that we can ensure an environment that will allow our countries and our peoples to prosper. That has been the raison d'etre for my foreign policy of peace. There are many challenges, however, in the roads towards that peaceful and prosperous future that we envision. Signs of another nuclear and space arms race are hovering over us. We are caught between the dual challenge of uh, the dual challenge of opportunity, and presented by advanced and emergency emerging technologies, chief of which, of course, is uh, AI. 
Smaller countries like the Philippines are grappling with the need to enhance our security capabilities alongside allies and partners and amidst larger regional players. So allow me this afternoon to speak more specifically about the two challenges that I believe are the most crucial to our common aspirations now. Number one is securing the peace in the West Philippine Sea. The Indo-Pacific region, particularly the West Philippine Sea, is in the middle of a global geopolitical transformation and has become an arena of normative contestation. Tensions in the West Philippine Sea are growing with persistent and lawful threats and challenges against Philippine sovereign rights and jurisdiction over our exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. Actions that violate obligations under international law, particularly the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS and the 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea. Our regular routine and resupply missions at Ayungin Shoal are subjective to coercive tactics and dangerous maneuvers of Coast Guard and maritime militia vessels in the West Philippine Sea, putting the lives of our people at risk and challenging the rule of law in that, that has defined our baselines, our economic zone, and uh, the maritime territory of the Philippines. There is rampant, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and militarization of reclaimed features in the South China Sea. There have been recent missions to Escoda and Rom Romulo Reef, revealed a, which revealed a direct correlation between the presence of maritime militia vessels and reef damage in those features. If only for that, the impact of bio on biodiversity and the environment are, are, I'm afraid, are assessed as possibly already irreversible. This imperils livelihoods, this imperils the future generations of Filipinos. So I have said it before, and I will say it again. The Philippines will not give a single square inch of our territory to any foreign power. The law is clear, as defined by the UNCLOS, and the final and binding 2016 award on the South China Sea arbitration. Supported by the rules-based international order and our growing partnerships, both time-tested and new ones, we will insist on the preservation of the sovereignty and integrity of the country while working closely with international partners in the bilateral, regional, and multilateral settings in developing rules and processes to address these challenges. We appreciate certainly the concrete manifestations of the U.S. and the growing number of our other partners in support for the Philippine position. The strong factual messaging in support of our lawful exercise of our rights under international law and which will call out recent incidents in our EEZ. It demonstrates the strength of our alliance and partnership and challenges attempts to, pers to perpetuate false narratives that has become a very important front in all of these uh, events that are happening in, uh, around the, in and around the Philippines. But un unfortunately, rhetoric is not enough. We need to upgrade our defense and civilian law enforcement capabilities, not only to defend ourselves, but also to enable us to become a reliable partner in promoting and guaranteeing regional security. That will require greater substantial infusions into funding streams needed for our armed forces and Coast Guard modernization plans, including lines of effort to enhance cyber cooperation. I am optimistic from our recent engagement with our American counterparts, including U.S. legislatures and certainly in the executive department, to elevate our partnership and dedicate resources to match our commitments. Over the past week, our teams have been working on a bilateral planning and tracking mechanism that is expected to accelerate concrete and substantial capability development investments and activities in order to meet our shared defense and security objectives over the next five years. Our defense secretaries also just met in Jakarta on the sidelines of the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus 
to discuss efforts to further strengthen our alliance. The second item that I feel is very important is the, sec the securing strategic sectors and critical infrastructure. And especially as uh, we have all begun to recognize the importance of activities in cyberspace. At the same time, ladies and gentlemen, we also need to address broader notions of security. And that now will include economic security. We welcome public-private partnerships, particularly engagements between and outside our military and defense establishments. For example, the Aguila Subic Shipyard Project supports Philippine efforts to position Subic Bay as a logistics hub and complements Hader readiness and initiatives. USAID development projects can also be harnessed to help boost our economic resilience. We hope to expand these partnerships in critical and strategic sectors and infrastructure. Just the other day, I witnessed on the sidelines of the APEX Summit in San Francisco the signing of the Philippines-United States Agreement for Cooperation Concerning Peaceful Uses of Nuclear Energy, or what is more commonly known as a 1-2-3 agreement. This opens the doors for U.S. companies to invest and to participate in nuclear power projects in the Philippines. This is expected to boost national efforts towards securing an affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy supply. Our cooperation on cyber security is also a priority as it impacts both national and economic security. Critical infrastructure, whether with respect to ports, to energy, telecommunications, they will require cybersecurity measures to be in place for the country to be resilient. These systems form the backbone of our military infrastructure, our hospital systems, our agriculture manufacturing, services sectors. In September, we launched the 2023 to 2032 National Innovation Agenda and Strategy Document. This is the Philippine government's 10-year innovation plan establishing the country's goals and strategies to improve innovation, governance, and establish a dynamic innovation ecosystem in critical areas. Learning and education, for example, health, food, agribusiness, finance, manufacturing and trade, transportation and logistics, public administration, security and defense, energy, blue economy, and water supply. We anticipate Many areas where the U.S. as a leader in innovation and emerging technology can also be our major partner. Our teams are looking to convene the inaugural interagency PHUS Cyber Dialogue sometime early next year to follow through on our commitment to enhance cooperation in the face of new and emerging threats, including completing, completing a full assessment of the cyber threat landscape and the establishment of next steps to counter cyber threats. So friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these challenges will continue to, in, to evolve, but I am confident that together we will be able to manage them. Our alliance is stronger than ever because it has been founded on our shared values, our mutual respect and trust of each other as equal sovereign partners and the unbreakable bonds between our two peoples. Our recent engagements across branches and levels of government confirm that we are committed to this relationship for the long term. At the same time, our growing network of partners, including Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the UK, European Union, will serve as force multipliers, which will help us bring bring our country closer to the vision of a peaceful, secure, and prosperous nation within a secure and prosperous region. So I hope to continue this dialogue with all of you as we make our way on this principal path that we have chosen. We today are defining the future, the future for ourselves in our lifetime, but also for the generations to come. Thank you very much. Mahalo, Nuilo.
Merci. 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 Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those incredible <coughs> insights and perspectives and your vision for the future and how we can collaborate to make it a more secure and stable and prosperous region. Uh, before I start with some questions, and I'll tell you how the questions got synthesized, but I couldn't help uh, yesterday, your team <laughs> mm -hmm. came in here and started to put all these little artifacts. I know some of the folks in the back can't see it, but uh, Your Excellency, can you explain any of these artifacts that these are up are, here? These are jeepneys. <laughs> We know uh, about jeepneys. Uh, if you don't know what a jeepney is, uh, these are, these are uh, the, transport, the, the, the jeeps that were left behind by the Americans after the war, which were converted into transport, uh, transport systems. And they comprise a very large percentage of our transportation system. And the reason that we are highlighting them is because we are in the midst of an effort to go fully electric when it comes to public transport. Uh, this is our continuing effort uh, as a response, of course, to climate change to um, improve uh, the, uh, re the mix of energy consumption and supply uh, from uh, the traditional fossil fuels uh, to more renewables. We have uh, uh, been uh, uh, reasonably successful, we are presently approaching 30% in terms of the energy mix, 30% renewable in terms of the energy mix uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the country's energy supply. And uh, that is why we put them out here to remind all that despite their very traditional look, they are being heavily modernized. Yes, sir. And, and I just came from the Philippines, and I have to tell you this. Yeah, these are definitely still there, and, and people are using it. So, well, thank you for that, really. And for the audience, what we have done for purposes of time is we have many folks that we've invited to, to present us with a question, and our team synthesized it. And just with the constraint of the time that we have, I understand it, so I'll try to ask as much as I can before we sure. have to, to terminate. I shall, but our, our, I shall try to be brief. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> your Excellency, your comment about the critical challenges that we face out there was pretty, uh, was pretty vivid in terms of what we all face. Yeah. But you also talked about opportunities and how you seek to resolve uh, disagreements through peaceful means. Mm. So I, I was wondering if you can elaborate on this relationship. I understand you met with the Admiral Aquilino and his team today and during your time here. Perhaps share with the audience some of those initiatives that you're looking at with the United States regarding promoting be better cooperation and collaboration in the future. Well, the, the, the basic idea, of course, of all of this is that uh, the United States is our, um, I would say, our oldest uh, and most traditional partner. Uh, in, um, that, has been, that has been in various forms uh, ongoing for over a hundred years. And uh, I think it, uh, it is, uh, serves as well to remember that the United States is the Philippines' only treaty partner. And that is why that the, with the increasing heighten, the, the heightening tension in the West Philippine Sea, as we have named it, uh, because uh, uh, it is generally known as the South China Sea, uh, the increasing tensions in the South China Sea uh, require that we partner with the, our, our allies and our friends around the world uh, so as to be able to uh, come to some kind of resolution and to maintain the peace. And as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, really what the, uh, it's the, uh, the foreign policy of the, of the Philippines is really rather simple. And it really comes down to two things. Number one, peace. And number two, the national interest. And in, in that sense, we, have, uh, we no longer subscribe to the old uh, thinking wherein it is a bipolar world and uh, each of the countries will choose whether to be with the Soviet Union or to be with the United States. I do not think, it is not, in my view, this is no longer applicable, uh, no longer relevant to the way the state of affairs as they have evolved uh, geopolitically. So it is important that uh, we continue to strengthen that partnership. And the main partner is of, co of the Philippines is, of course, the United States. But starting with that, 
uh, we also feel that it is the, the way forward is to strengthen our partnerships in all, uh, with, with all our neighbors and with all our friendly, with all friendly nations who share our ideals, who share our aspirations, who share our values and the respect for the international rule of law. And this has been something that we have tried to develop and we have, uh, I believe, uh, uh, have, have had some uh, uh, measure of success and we will continue to do this. But again, the bedrock of any of these partnerships is the partnership and the treaty arrangement that we have, the mutual defense treaty that we have with the United States. And in that regard, we are continuing to uh, increase our uh, capabilities so as to be able to answer the challenges that, uh, that we are facing um, every, well now it's becoming more and more often, uh, every so often whenever there is a confrontation between outside forces and Philippine forces. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately, uh, as I have uh, said uh, to some of our partners, uh, unfortunately I cannot report that uh, the situation is improving. The situation has become more dire than it was before. The, uh, the nearest reefs uh, that uh, uh, the PLA have started to show interest in, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, slowly uh, using these atolls, these shoals, as a basis for building, uh, basis really is what, is what they are, are approaching, the, have, have come closer and closer to the Philippine coastline. And the nearest one is now around 60 nautical miles from the nearest Philippine coast. And this, uh, this is an evolving situation. Uh, if you will remember, the Spratly Islands was used by the American, uh, by the U.S. Navy as a, uh, um, as a bombing range for a very long time. And so the, the, there, was no, there was no question that this was part of the Philippines. Now they have fallen into the hands of a foreign power. And many of these features uh, that, are, that are in the West Philippine Sea are slowly uh, being turned into bases, really. Uh, the uh, uh, Admiral uh, Aquilino just showed me a, a relief sort of a map, not, not, not map, but model uh, of one of them. And the, it is remarkable the extent, the ex how the extensive uh, construction and the level of uh, uh, commitment that has been made to those uh, military bases. And so it's not, uh, it, is, it is something that we, that in our view, uh, of course the United States once again is the bedrock, is a, the foundation for all that. But the more allies we find to speak up uh, whenever such uh, incursions are, occur, such incidents or events occur, uh, then I think the stronger that voice will be. And so we, we have encouraged that uh, to a great deal. The United States, of course, has been there. Uh, and in every instance where we have had trouble, uh, the U.S. has always been behind us in terms of support, uh, not only in terms of rhetoric, but also in terms of concrete support. Uh, and, but that, is also, that also applies now to Australia, to Same. South Korea, to Japan. We are now in the midst of uh, uh, negotiating our own code of conduct, for example, with Vietnam, because we are still waiting for the code of conduct between China and, the, and ASEAN. And the progress has been rather slow, unfortunately. And so we've taken the initiative to, to approach those other countries around ASEAN with whom we have existing territorial conflicts, Vietnam being one of them, Malaysia being another and to, uh, to make our own code of, code of conduct, and hopefully this will, be, uh, uh, this will grow further and extend into the other ASEAN countries. And at the very least, we have that basis between uh, not only in the multilateral sphere, as in ASEAN, or APEC, all of these other organizations, but also bilaterally with the different countries uh, that, uh, around ASEAN who we have, who we have 
uh, conflicts with, but uh, whom I think we can, uh, uh, we can find a way to maintain the status quo and certainly the most primordial concern is to maintain the peace. Thank you, Mr. President. I, when I listened to you and, and how you repeated actually some of the key tenets of what you were saying in your speech, I remember just a recent visit I had in Manila mm -hmm. and speaking to not just General Browner, but your Secretary of Defense, Teodoro, and others. That is a consistent message of your firm res uh, resolve to work things peacefully, but to work with the United States and other like-minded partners mm -hmm. around the region, particularly in Southeast Asia. I would also offer you, when you talked about the rules based order, international order, and how you've got the, the favorable findings from the Tribunal Court of uh, Arbitration in 2016, that all underscores what we are all trying to do, which is to maintain that peace and prosperity, but following the rules based international order. Now, you mentioned something in your speech, and you covered it quickly, but I think every country is wrestling with it in terms of technology, mm -hmm. emerging technology. How, how do you view that strategically? How can you leverage technology in terms of building and enhancing relationship and cooperation with other countries? Well, I, I think it, it, it applies uh, to essentially every sector. Uh, one of uh, the great events uh, in the recent past has been COVID. And COVID showed us, showed us a new way of doing everything. Uh, it showed us a new way of living, a new way of working, a new way of interacting with one another, a new way of living. And that has been brought about, that, that those solutions have been brought about by technology. So if we go to, a, to a, another sector, uh, which applies to every other single sector that we ever discuss in government, and that's climate change. Climate change was brought about by burgeoning technologies, which we did not realize mm. were going to uh, uh, poison the planet to this extent um, over 200 years or so. Uh, but then we also looked to technology to, be the, to bring us the solutions mm. uh, in this, in, for this, uh, this, this existential challenge that we are all facing. So let's bring it back now to the, the question of security again. Technology, I think, will provide many of the solutions. But of course, at the very beginning of all that is the resolve of each country in partnership with other countries to continue to maintain the rule of law mm. and to do that in the interest of peace. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have been trying to promote. And I do believe, I am very encouraged by the discussions that we have had, not only with the U.S., but with other countries, that this, uh, it, it is well understood that this is, in fact, the way forward, that we must, con we must uh, co collaborate uh, to bring those technologies to, to the fore uh, so that we, our people can, uh, can reap the advantages of that. Now, the latest... Uh, uh, the latest technology that everyone, of course, is looking to, as it is exceedingly powerful, is AI. Uh, and we uh, uh, have just received the news uh, that uh, there has been within the AI community this conflict as to whether or how far to push it without regulation. I know, I know President Biden has just signed a document that uh, says that this must be regulated, monitored, and regulated properly. Because we have seen the uh, rather more sinister uses of, uh, of uh, artificial technology. On the other hand, uh, we must always remember it is a double-edged sword, and it can swing in a way that will help us. And I think the if uh, we are trying to, as we are trying to transform our economy in the Philippines, as we all are, as a matter of fact, after COVID, uh, in the face of Ukraine, and now in the Middle East, uh, we, we have, uh, we, we have uh, tried to bring these new technologies into, uh, into the fore. But once again, we have to be more cognizant of uh, what are the risks involved. And the reason that it is so difficult is because these things never existed before in human history. And we are making this up as we go, go along, as it were. And there are very many unintended consequences to something quite so powerful. Once again, just look at the Industrial Revolution. There was no way 
that uh, when the Victorians started uh, the, um, uh, the Industrial Revolution, that they would say 200 years down the road, we are going to have to think about global warming. We're going to have to think about melting the ice in uh, the poles. Uh, so we have to be extremely careful. And also because technology has evolved so rapidly. And that is another reason that we have to pay a good deal of attention to it. Because uh, it can easily, we will easily be left behind. If we rest on our laurels and say we've got this figured out, that is the moment that we get into trouble. And so we continue to look to the United States and to technology leaders like the United States to provide uh, the guidance and to the lessons, rather, that uh, you have learned being at the forefront, uh, and the, both the good lessons and the lessons that were not quite as successful, and hopefully apply that uh, in the Philippines. And I'm, uh, again, uh, with, with the discussions that we have had with the U.S. and with other countries as well, I, I feel confident that so long as we are, we are aware that there is a possible danger and we think things through properly, then we will be able to take full advantage of AI and of other new technologies. On the other hand, if we sit back and just let it take over our lives, that is exactly what it will do. It will take over our lives. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm pressed for time, but I need to ask oh. this because I hear, I heard you say ASEAN. I know the Philippines is a founding mm. uh, member of ASEAN, and I think in uh, 2026, you will assume the, the position of chair. Yes, uh, we all know in the audience regarding uh, what happened in Myanmar mm -hmm. and how the juntas had really, uh, their actions in Myanmar really undermined the centrality and just the basic understanding between the ASEAN countries. Uh, it may be uh, too far ahead to ask in terms of in your role as the ASEAN chair, but what, was, what were you thinking as the leader of the Philippines to be looking to help ASEAN grow into uh, an adaptive role, in, particularly in terms of what has happened in the region that kind of destabilized it? Well, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of Myanmar, it has really been a, uh, uh, a difficult problem for the, for the whole of ASEAN. Uh, for, one, for one thing, uh, the, there are different conditions. Uh, for example, Myanmar, when there's fighting in Myanmar, the refugees cross over into they cross over the 2,000-mile border that Thailand has with Myanmar, and uh, they have that particular problem. Then there are Islamic countries uh, in, our, in, in, in ASEAN who also have an interest because of uh, the persecution that is being seen uh, on the Muslim communities in Myanmar. The general, the general um, approach uh, until quite recently has been to write down the five points of consensus as we have for ASEAN. Everyone has signed off on it. In fact, even Myanmar has signed off on it. Uh, and continue to work with the, uh, with the national, with the leadership and uh, also the, uh, the opposition to that leadership uh, so as to have some kind of a balanced discussion. Unfortunately, we really have to admit that we have not made very much progress even since, since the writing of the five points of consensus uh, that ASEAN has uh, agreed upon. So there has been a, a significant shift uh, that really occurred in the last, in the, in the last ASEAN in the chairman, under the chairmanship of Indonesia where it became very clear, and upon the urging actually of Han Seng of Cambodia, uh, and his, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, argument went this, like this. And I said, and he says that there have, uh, when, I was, when I became leader, they, nobody wanted to talk to me because uh, I was not uh, regarded or recognized as the leader. And he says, but who else will they talk to? And so, now they spoke to me and we have found a way to work. The different countries around have found a way to work. And this is the same situation as in Myanmar. Uh, if you insist on only handling these issues at a very high level, which is what the principle was in the beginning, 
uh, that we only talk government to government, ASEAN to government. And unless, they re unless there's progress made on that front, then there is no progress made. So the shift has, the shift has come. And we now, uh, under the informal auspices of, uh, of ASEAN, uh, each country is allowed to make approaches to the Myanmar leadership and the opposition, all the stakeholders in Myanmar, to try and find a solution to the problems that, uh, that, are, being, that are being faced. And as in any conflict, the, the, the humanitarian side of it, the humanitarian uh, 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 cost has grown exponentially over the past two, three years. And, and so that just makes, the, that just makes the, the situation even more urgent than it was before. So we have encouraged a slightly different approach. The Philippines is playing its part, and we, are, we have an interest in the Myanmar conflict for the simple reason that the, it affects the Philippines as well. And in terms, not in terms of actual fighting or refugees, but in terms of things like human trafficking. Uh, we have had to rescue many of our nationals from Myanmar and bring them back to the Philippines as they were human trafficked. They, was, they, they had been trafficked to, uh, to work in usually uh, illegal, uh, illegal activities. Uh, so there is a great deal of, of impetus for ASEAN to solve this problem. But it is a very, very difficult problem as it has involved other players, and it's not just the leadership in Myanmar. One of the most disturbing analyses that we have seen is that actually the military junta has lost, uh, has lost support from its own military, mm. and it only carries on with uh, their, uh, their uh, militaristic uh, and really terroristic activities by air power and that air power has been provided not by uh, not not by Myanmar itself but from uh, foreign countries and uh, that is so that is why I propose I said maybe it's time to talk to those who are supplying the arms or those who are supplying the airplanes and the bombs and to say that uh, we have to find a way to bring a hiatus, at least a hiatus to this, to try and do something about the humanitarian problem. And then perhaps that will be a first step. And once we are discussing that, and once we are more active and allowed to operate more within the country, and to have more contact and more communication, perhaps that will lead to something else. And so that, is, uh, that, that presently is the state. Uh, of affairs when it, uh, from, for ASEAN when it comes to Myanmar. Uh, when, the, when the chair comes to the Philippines, uh, when the ASEAN chair comes to the Philippines, this is, this is still what we intend to promote within uh, our neighboring countries. And uh, to find a way, I, 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 always, I always quote, uh, I, I'm a great believer that you should try everything everywhere all the time. Uh, simply because you cannot predict by any stretch of the imagination where it will succeed. And my best example is always who would have thought that diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China would come about because of table tennis. But it did. <laughs> and so let's try everything. Let's try, let's talk to our, 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 our friends, uh, our, perhaps our adversaries, but try everything. And that is what we will try to promote. We are, we are not, uh, we are, uh, we are perfectly aware of the history of such negotiations. And, uh, for example, the peace treaty that was in fact signed in Oslo that was unofficial between, uh, in the Middle East, and again the Chinese U China U.S. And it, there are many examples of this. And that's why I, I uh, when the chair comes to the Philippines. We will once again remind our partners and say that we should not be too picky about how we get in touch or how we communicate with the, uh, with the military leadership in Myanmar on how we negotiate and how we discuss with the other stakeholders. Uh, because it's not just the political opposition. 
Unfortunately, both sides in this conflict, both the military junta and the opposition, politically, the political opposition, have grown, have taken on a very, very hard line, and they will not speak to one another. Um, perhaps that's the role that ASEAN can play: is to come in between the two, the two parts, and hopefully, hopefully, bring them together. If not totally, but at least in certain ways and move, start the process, start the process. There is no process as yet. Start the process and hopefully it will bring a more equitable and peaceful situation in Myanmar to the benefit of all of us in ASEAN and all of Asia for that matter. Well, Your Excellency, your, your insights, I must say, is very refreshing. Mm -hmm and encourages all of us to work harder to, to collaborate to, to this vision that you've laid out. And I truly think we must try everything. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give, help me and give a round of applause, <laughs> Mr. President. And sir, uh, before we conclude the speaker series, I understand you have a special presentation to the state of Hawaii. Yes. And if I can ask Lieutenant Governor uh, Sylvia Luke to come up, as well as Congressman Case, Congresswoman Takuda, Senator Aquino, and Senator Dela Cruz, please come up and join. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. August 2023 wildfires affected various areas in Maui, particularly the historic town of Lahaina. In a spirit of unity and compassion, President Marcos instructed relevant agencies to collaborate with the state of Hawaii to assist grieving families and help affected communities rebuild. With this humble donation, the Philippines stands in solidarity with the state of Hawaii and continues to pray and hope for the full recovery of Maui as it embarks on a rebuilding the island. Madam Governor, thank you. It's just a simple donation to help uh, all our friends. And, uh, we have already made efforts to, to uh, provide support to our Philippine nationals in, in Maui, but again, uh, in uh, solidarity with the state of Hawaii, we thought we would... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. So, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's DKI speaker series. Sir, a sincere salama po to you for your exceptional remarks. Um, you've provided us much to think about uh, today, and we are so grateful for your leadership. And we look forward. Uh, DKAPCSS to come back out to, to the Philippines and, and join and work together with Indopaycom and the team of, uh, of uh, our folks in the United States to promote a more peaceful and prosperous region. For everyone that's here, especially those that are out in Hawaii, that normally don't talk about defense in the way we do at APCSS, uh, you heard today from Your Excellency, just how complex and the, the world is and so dynamic the changes are. You also heard that the United States remains steadfast in working with strong allies like the Philippines and other like-minded countries, many Consul Generals represent those countries here today to ensure stability, security, and prosperity throughout the region and I might say around the world. So as we conclude, as they say in the islands, malama pono, malama kekahi ikekahi, which is take care of yourself and take care of each other. And aloha. Aloha. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir.